We're here with Nate Bolt. Nate, thank you very much for doing this with us. My pleasure. And I'll jump in right to the first question. Why does UX research get ignored? I think a lot of times it's timing. It comes in too late and the, deci the real decisions have already been made. And it gets, you know, pe even people that recognize the value of it are doing a lot of other things, you know, understandably. And they, you know, can't quite take the time that it needs in the schedule to really, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of like at the last minute, it's still helpful. Some still some minor things maybe get implemented, but if there are some bigger issues, I think those are the things that get ignored because it's like, look, man, we don't got time for that. I think time is the biggest number one reason. So should we do that early? Refuse to do late, you know, <laughs> late stage research? I, you know, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's still valuable, and like right. maybe the next time around with that team, they'll request it earlier. It'll happen earlier. Or, you know, they'll try and make some some way to have it be part of the schedule or do it faster or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I don't know if there's much can be done about that. Okay. Um, you're considered as an authority about um, everything related to remote research. Uh. <laughs> like it or not, this, this is what's, what's happening. Um, how can remote research help UX practitioners get better buy-in for their work? I think it can be a little easier to execute. Um, I'm a big fan of all different types of casual research, you mm -hmm. know, any kind of observational behavioral stuff, even if it's somebody that sits down the hall, I'm a huge fan of that. So sometimes remote can just be a way to get outside of that small circle real quick, you know, and, and then sometimes that can help stakeholders feel like it's a little more valid because it's not Frank from accounting, you know, who looked at the last five prototypes. It's like somebody that's, you know, somewhere else in there. Right. It's slightly more realistic. Okay. Can you tell me a story about a difficult stakeholder that didn't understand what you were doing, it was very difficult to work with? Well, I found... Even disrespectful of the process. <laughs> we <laughs> haven't had too many people disrespectful, thankfully. <laughs> um, I've definitely found that some people don't see a lot of value in qualitative behavioral research. Okay. You know, the, some people just think that it's not scientific, it's not statistically significant, it's not, you know, something that... Um, they think you can base important interface decisions off of. And I also don't think that there's much you can do about that. So we've certainly had that happen where we've presented research results and people have sort of said, well, it's only eight people. I mean, kind of baseline methodological questions that we've all heard a million times. You know, we've kind of explained all the standard things about that. But in those cases, I'm kind of, I feel like I support those people. If they don't believe in it, I've never seen anything change their minds. So um, this reminds me of one trick that a colleague of mine from um, Shanghai uh, told me about, and it worked like magic. I did it once. He assassinated um, them all. Um, close. No. <laughs> um, what he did, of course, he presented, he suggested a study, proposed a study with five participants, usability test, and everybody said, no, 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 that's uh, five participants is not enough. And he um, asked them back, what is a number you're, you'll, you'll be comfortable with? And they thought about it a little bit and they said 50. We want 50 participants for this usability right. test. Right. And um, you know, most of us would respond to that, no way, we're not going to do that. 50 participants, it's a waste of time. But he said, okay, let's run a study with 50 participants. Nice. And um, if it's okay with you, we'll recruit them in groups of five. So we'll start with the first five. If we want to continue, we'll recruit the next five, and then the next five, and the next five. And they were okay with that. And of course, after the seventh or eighth participant, they just right. said, oh, okay. right. We get it. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, That's good. So that's, yeah. And it works. Yeah, it's true. Um, but it only works once, because, <laughs> because <laughs> then, then they understand. You only right. need to do that once with the same team you're working with, totally. and they get it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's really, I really liked it that he didn't say no. Yeah. <laughs> because we are, we're, we're very protective of our methods. So well, or just on time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I really liked that, that, that trick. Yeah, that's it's cool. Very nice. I like that. Um, 
related to that. Many UX practitioners get emotional when they negotiate with their stakeholders. They feel underappreciated and frustrated. What can you recommend to these people? Two things. One, just execute the research. Any conversations about how it should be done or, or when or with whom can be, you know, you can get through those. Even if it's with a, a, a difficult, you know, research partner or a difficult team. And then when you're do, you know, the second is when you're doing it, you've got to involve those people. You know, there has to be a collaboration. If they're not willing to collaborate and just attend the sessions, you're screwed anyways. So there's nothing you can do. Might as well just know that it's going to be difficult. I, you know, I don't think it's wise to get really emotional about it because those are your only two options. You know, prepare nicely with them and get them to, to sort of work with and collaborate on it. If you're stuck having to deliver the results, like capital T, capital R, it's always bad. You know, that people expect you to deliver like the sun, the moon, and the stars, and then when you don't, they'll be like critical of the methods and, and critical of your expertise, and, and then I think you're in a bad place. All right. Um, what is the most effective research deliverable that you found to be affecting clients, internal or external, um, to act on research results? I stop believing in them, you know. I mean, we we try not to do any more research deliverables. Like I just so what do you do? seen them end up in the trash can. I mean, the most effective thing is at the end of the day when you've done five users, or at the end of the second day when you've done ten, everybody talks about what patterns they saw. The facilitator, you know, leads the conversation and then comes up with a somewhat agreed upon list of like top five critical findings, you know, top five successes, top five issues to discuss more captures that in whatever Word doc or Google doc or, you know, anything, uh, and, and then kind of refines that so that there's a, a record of what everybody already agreed on. Mm -hmm. So that, that's it. I mean, that's the only thing at this stage in the game that I've found to be consistently, you know, effective. Because any fancy reports, fancy presentations, fancy slides, they can, even when they go over the best, when everybody's like standing <laughs> ovation, like, you know, so happy, they're just like, poof, right in the trash, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the only lasting thing is when those people feel like they participated. Cool. Um, let's talk more about remote research. Um, cool. I talk with a lot of startup founders and, and people who work in startups. They want to do research. They don't have the money to hire a consultant that will do that for them. They mm -hmm. don't know how to do that on their own. Um, how can remote research help them, if at all? Well, um, in the same way that guerrilla research can, you know, it can just be really easy to I am somebody or use any old, you know, intercept anything to get people and then just have them join a go-to meeting or whatever and share their screen. I mean, it's same exact principle as grabbing somebody in the hallway, you know. It can be a 12-minute affair. <laughs> um, anybody that's comfortable with sharing a screen in Skype or sharing a screen in WebEx, or, you know, can do it. So it's... I think it's becoming more and more and more basic. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a time when screen sharing was like, ooh, crazy, <laughs> you know? Tipbuck2 and all these programs. <laughs> um, we used to mail CD-ROMs to participants for them to install mm -hmm. screen sharing software, which is crazy. Um, but now, I mean, it's just in the same vein as grabbing somebody in the hallway. So I think you can help make it quick, you know, and make it seem geographically disparate or yeah. you know it can you can get all these sort of side benefits mm -hmm. cool these are all the questions i have for you anything okay. else you want to talk about or ask um or? no i mean there's just, you know the, the only other thing about remote stuff that can help people i've seen a lot of startups a lot of really small companies they're just dying to ask people what do you think and it's like my least favorite research question in the history of the universe mm -hmm. you know, because it just yields total bullshit mm -hmm. and I try and encourage them with the remote stuff. Most startups aren't at this stage, but if they do have something functional that exists in the world, you know, to try and get people who give a crap about that interface to be participants can really transform the, the experience of watching them, you know? Because yeah. when you just ask somebody to care, if I'm like, Tomer, I made this widget for music aggregation or something. That's what they do. Right, like, what do you think? And you're like... Would you buy it? Yeah, <laughs> uh, sure, I like the colors. You know, it just yields a lot of bad data. And so finding people, you know, remotely that have a, a attachment both in that moment, you know, and in general to whatever it is that you're testing, I think that can be really powerful. 
Hard to hard to do though, you know. Especially yeah, if you don't have a lot of, Not a lot of startups do that. Right. Yeah. They, they, hard to execute. I see that they really want to talk with people. Mm -hmm. They really want the feedback. Mm -hmm. But then they get and they get there. They find the people to talk with, and then they just ask all the wrong questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of cool. We're we're, start, we're thinking about doing, um, sort of working with a couple other companies to do on-demand moderation. So, you know, if you find your customer, like, in the moment doing something, but you can't moderate them right then and there, somebody else can, <laughs> you know, and then you can just watch. So that, you know, I think that could potentially help people make it a little bit easier, you know, to have kind of like a, a panel of moderators instead of a panel of users. Uh -huh. um, what do you think about services such as user testing and there are dozens more? Yeah. Um, well, I'm biased. I mean, you know, we partner with user testing pretty closely with that, you know. You know, and I was just down at their offices like two weeks ago. So I think I've now feel biased. Okay. You know, like before when I had this consulting company, you know, Bull Peters, we did all use all tools for whatever client. You know, so we I felt like we were pretty objective. And now, you know, I guess in my job at Facebook as a research manager, we don't use as many external tools. I think that that's I'm getting a feeling that that's a little more standard for big companies. You don't use, like consulting, I feel like you're always trying to mix and match new methods, new tools, like kind of have to be a little bit more on the ball. Uh -huh. Product side feels like, look, it's so complicated getting anything done anyways. You know, we tend to use the same tools, um, so I don't use them as much now. So, you know, I'm not as hip on the game. Yeah. Um, but I, I love that stuff. I mean, I love them all, basically. Anybody that's creating, like, usability, user testing, Loop 11, all yeah. these kind of optimal... Um, I think it's such a ridiculously small target market still. Yeah. That I like I mean, that there's building. I mean, user testing has a bigger market. I mean, yeah. they've sort of branched out, but you know, Usabilla and like even Ethneo, you know, it's pretty focused to like the 13 people that do this stuff. <laughs> you know, worldwide. Okay. So, I guess I'm just happy that all those tools exist, all right. you know. <laughs> okay. Uh perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. Cool.